Uh, my name is Vanessa Scott, and I'm the Director of Industry Relations and Innovation here at Scripps Oceanography. Uh, Douglas Alden is the Chair of the Scripps Technical Forum and Lead Engineer for the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, and he is out in the field today, um, so I am standing in as host. Uh, we definitely encourage an interactive discussion. Uh, we want to hear from you and uh, answer your questions. So please feel free to raise your hand throughout to be unmuted and directly ask Paul the questions um, and or put your questions into the chat or the Q&A function at the bottom center of the screen. And I will be happy to moderate them. Um, this session will be recorded and available uh, on the Scripps Technical Forum website and on the YouTube playlist afterwards. Um, also, you can find more information and past recordings on the website in the channel. Um, we always welcome your feedback and suggestions on future topics and speakers. So please reach out to us for uh, your ideas and for any suggestions, either myself or Douglas, our email addresses are up there. Uh, and with that, I am excited to introduce our speaker today, Paul Devine with Teledyne RDI, who's gonna be talking about deciphering your ADCB data. So I will hand it over to you, Paul, and stop sharing. Okay. Thank you, Vanessa. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So you can see my desktop now. That's great. <laughs> and let's start and then swap. Yep. Hi. Perfect. Nice. Okay, so as uh, Vanessa, thank you very much for the for the opportunity to participate today. Um, we really have been working with scripts um, for a very, very long time, and we appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with you on all of your oceanographic studies. Um, your intro slide had a picture of a workhorse someplace off the pier. Um, you know, we've had a we've had a long history with scripts, so it's been it's really good to be here today and to be able to participate. Um, so for those of you that don't know Teledyne, right, we're, um, as it says here, a very expansive selection of equipment and solutions for a, a single clear choice for a, 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 a vendor for your, you know, to help you collect better oceanographic data. Um, we've got a, this image here, we, we work in a wide variety of marine environments and, and in a wide variety of applications, but what we're going to be talking about today is you know, moored ADCPs over here in the far left corner and right down here where the ADCP can be connected to a real-time observatory. Please also know, you know, we could, we could put an ADCP on a glider, um, on an ROV, on a research vessel, um, AUV, um, so I'm I'm particularly interested in in ADCPs. I was a customer before I came to work at RDI in 1999, um, and uh, it's been it's been quite a ride. I've, I've, I'm kind of pinch myself every time I I come to work because this is just a beautiful place to be and a great company to work for. Um, in 2005, Teledyne bought RDI, and. Uh, Today, we have a wide variety of, of products within three main verticals, right? So uh, as an FYI for all of you with Scripps, right? So seismic equipment, interconnect is a separate business than the imaging and the instruments where I reside. Um, but, you know, so I'm, 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 I can help anyone at this at Scripps with cameras and multi-beams and single beam echo sounders and um, hydrographic software multi or uh, imaging underwater imaging sonars ins systems cable and pipe trackers acoustic modems releases in addition to adcps um, if you do want to if you do want help with interconnect or vehicles gliders auvs asvs i can get you in touch with the right person so please um my email will be it there at the end i think yeah you pretty much um i see that ron george is here um nice to see you ron um, Ron, uh, you were, the Z-boat's still going strong, Ron. Um, about RDI, a bit. Um, not, founded in 1982, acquired by Teledyne in 2005. Uh, we're right up the road in Poway. So we really strongly encourage you, give me a call. I'll give you a factory tour. Come see where the ADSPs and the DVLs are made. Um, uh, we have a great production system. It's really, it's interesting to see how the way we make the transducers, um, test all the systems. Um, 
a test tank facility where we verify the accuracy of the systems before we ship them. You know, each system, each individual ADCP gets fully wrung out and, and verified prior to shipment. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite a facility. Uh, you're close. Please give me a call and, and I'll, I'll take you on a tour around the facility and we could talk more about your applications face to face. Um, again, um, ADCPs can be deployed in a number of ways. Um, moving surface vessels, ASVs, bottom mounted, buoy mounts. Today, we're really going to be talking about a bottom mounted upward looking data set. But the concept, you know, today when we talk about the data QA, the concept is the same, right? So for all these ADCPs, um, there's, there's a process that you use to QA the data and, you know, rubber stamp it and, and publish your results. Uh, I do see something in the chat. Oh, here's you, Vanessa, saying, thanks for joining. Please feel free to raise your hand. Please raise your hand. <laughs> um, so... Like I said, uh, this is a screen capture from our website, right? So the this these ADCP QA, the strategy can be applied to a, an ADCP, the Sentinel V, the Pinnacle, but also the DVLs, our um, Doppler velocity logs, also current profile. So your DVLs can become an ADCP, and your horizontal ADCPs and your all your river products are all same concept. Uh, it's the same QA thought process. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk, you know, the end result for you is the acoustic data, the current 3D water current profiles. Um, but, you know, you, in the Venn diagram of the ADCP data and then the external sensor and the quality data, they all kind of go together, right? So you know, you, you can't, you know, it's a, how do I say this? It's, it's, you have to understand what kind of, what, what, what motion the ADCP had relative to the ocean, whether it was moving, we can measure that with bottom tracking or with an external INS, or we can, um, you know, what, what direction was it pointed? Was it, was it pointed up? Was it pointed down? Where was it pointed? What's the tilt, the pressure, the temperature? And then we're gonna talk about the quality parameters, correlation and, and echo intensity and error velocity and how all this relates to your ADCP, you know, your end result, which is what are my currents relative to the bottom? Today, this data set that we're gonna go through, um, this is New York City. Uh, this is a picture of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge that my, my actual neighbor took, took a picture of um, from a ferry, but the ADCP is, right in this very vicinity here, close to the, the new, uh, close to downtown Manhattan. Um, Google Earth image, give credit to Google Earth. Um, the Arizona Narrows Bridge is, is uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, right? The Hudson River runs down New York City and um, empties into the bay there. Um, this is Jersey, hey, how you doing? Um, I'm from Philly, by the way, so. Every, I think everyone in this area and Philly area make fun of the people from Jersey. I don't know if anyone's from Jersey, but I, 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 I grew up right across the river. Um, but we got a, um, this area is the mouth of the river, right? So it's a tidal estuary and there's going to be, we'll see saltwater wedge in the data. We'll see the, the tidal signal, but um, no waves, no currents. This is a pretty basic, easy data set to start with. I really encourage any of you that if you want, you can secure file transfer us some data and we can do this with you, you know, in person. This data review. So this is a, a 30 day snippet of ADCP data from the underneath the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. And you can see um, the vertical scale here is water depth. So we see about a mean of 25 meters. Um, you see the current, this is current speed, and you see the tides, and you see the tidal, the variation in the currents with the tidal velocities. And I'm going to focus on this time period here where the ocean kind of skipped a beat, right? So this, if you look, you know, it looks peri very periodic. You see um, uh, spring tide, neap tide, spring tide. This is water depth, a time series of water depth and water temperature. So you see the water depth varied from around 26 to uh, 29 meters depth 
Um, and then, uh, so the, yeah, this, oops, excuse me, I inverted this. Um, temperature varied from around seven degrees to 20 to around 12. And it got as the, this is this deployment started December 1st, or this, this particular time series from December 1st. Um, look at the date, 2003, this is going back in the archives. Um, 2003 through uh, December 1st through December 31st. This is, this is midnight in New York, Times Square. So uh, you'll see the time series, right? We'll see um, speed. This is the depth averaged velocity in red, peaking depth average velocity peaking here at about one meter per second. And this time series, this time period that we're gonna zoom into, currents got over like 1.2, 1.15 meters per second uh, peak before the ocean skipped a beat and then pretty low. But you'll see the anomaly in direction, right? So the something definitely happened here, right? So we're gonna zoom in and see if this particular, see, see what happened during this time. Um, ADCP pitch and roll is pretty flat, right? You could see slight variations in the pitch and roll. This is the ADCP moving in its bottom mount slightly. So we zoom in on this period from, you know, 2, 2 p.m. December 10th to around 2 p.m. December 13th. So we zoom in on this, three-day time series and we see water temperature variation with in green with the um with the uh tides and then we see the tidal level tidal elevation swings and um uh you know mean current like we said before got up about 1.2 meters per second let's see there's another question oh it's vanessa laughing at me why, why are you laughing at me vanessa? <laughs> um, so, okay, um, uh, now we're looking, we're, we're looking at the current speed from near bottom to near surface and the current direction from near bottom to near surface. So uh, red is high, 1.5 meters per second near the surface, and blue, purple is zero. So we see here during this period, we've got around 40 centimeters per second near surface, 40 centimeters per second near bottom, and then zeros. We see that um, it's going in the current direction. We've got to the south at the surface here and to the north at the bottom. So we've got a, a period here where we had the current at the surface flowed out to sea for an entire day. It never it never flooded at the surface. It only flooded at the bottom. So these are individual profiles here. Um, high velocity, flooding, upriver. And you'll notice this is not like a standard logarithmic profile, right? This is, <laughs> sorry, I can't talk. Excuse me, I should have muted my phone. Um, higher velocity, middle of the water column. And then, the next ebb, when it was going out to sea towards New Jersey, you know, towards the, the mouth, towards the Atlantic, we had high velocity at the surface, lower velocity, middle of the water column, and then a subsea jet. Pretty crazy. Um, and then during the period where it was, where it should have been flooding at the surface, but was still ebbing, we've got ebb at the surface and flood at the bottom. And then after this event passed, we had significant you know, like the, like the estuary backed up. We had a significant flow at the surface. So the question is, you know, at the time, the question was, well, is this really, is this good data, right? Is it, up, is it is thumbs up or thumb down? So we'll go into the data QA parameters, right? So our standard quality indicators, um, we've got error, correlation, and echo are the three main data QA parameters that we have from the ADCP. Um, error um, is, a, is the, it's about the quality. It's an indication of the quality of the process data. It's really an estimate of the homogeneity of the ocean. And did all four of our slanted beams see the same velocity? Correlation is the information content, meaning what was, um, how, um, how well did the ADCP ping 
basically the front end of the ping correlate with the back end of the ping. So it's 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 um, it's about the information content in the signal return, and then the echo intensity is the strength of the return. How loud was the acoustic return? And it's it's proportional to sediment. And I was told I should not say bugs. I, I understand that biological oceanographers get really touchy about people calling them bugs. I should change the slide. Sediment and phyto and zooplankton. Um, uh, would would cause changes in the echo intensity. So during this period when the ocean skipped a beat, we go look at the error, velocity, correlation, and signal strength, acoustic intensity. And we see at this period, um, we see right where the shear, significant shear occurred, there was an increase in error in this plot, purple, is negative five centimeters per second and red is positive five centimeters per second. So we have like a two centimeter per second error um, during this period when the shear occurred. There are other periods here where we have um, spikes in error, you know, intermittent high errors. And those with all these points where, where we're seeing red or dark purple, um, those are those are those are points where you would you would put you know, if, um, error bars on your velocity measurement because those are periods with um, high error. Um, correlation, you can see the correlation is expected to be 128. We've got 128 everywhere except right at the very surface. And you do get some interference due to side lobes at the surface and that causes a reduction in the correlation and, and um, but still acceptable, we would normally flag the correlation as being bad at 64 counts. And then the echo, the signal strength, you'll see um, the signal strength decaying with range. And so as you go, as you're looking up towards the surface from the bottom out at ADCP, you see the water level, you see the surface. And um, these, because we're at the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, these are um, periods where you had container ships and you know vessels passing nearby the ADCP. So if you're, you know, just as an FYI, right? There's a lot of talk recently about using ADCP echo intensity for to kind of quantify sediment concentration and zooplankton biomass, and um, you do see, you know, the the echo sees it all, right? The echo sees sediment being kicked up from the bottom but it also sees bubbles. So you have to be really careful when you're doing these types of, you know, the using acoustics for either um, sediment concentration or biomass, you gotta be really careful about the background signal. Um, that's not, not the bugs and not the zooplankton. But for today's purpose, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna look into, into, into depth into, into all four of the beams, echo, correlation, and then the error. Um, to look for hom homogeneity across all four of the beams. So echo, it's the strength of the return signal. It, it reveals sediment, bubbles, zooplankton, bubbles from ships, <laughs> right? Um, and anomalies, right? If, if, if one of your beams is starting to fail, you will see a reduction in the signal strength on that beam. Um, We'll also see interference from a structure. If you had one of the beams of the ADCP hitting a, a pier pile or a fish, um, you'll see it as an increase in, in signal strength error. And then also an external sonar. Any other acoustics in our frequency band will show up as an anomaly in the echo intensity. But for this site, definitely fish passing ships, um, they cause anomalies in echo. So if we look at just qualitatively, if we look at this period, right, we see, we see, um, you know, prior to the ocean shutting down, there was a significant increase in the echo intensity at the surface. So these were um, looking back at the meteorology from, you know, the, at the weather during this period, there was a large storm that passed and there was an increase in, in rain uh, and wind. It was actually snow at that point and, and wind. 
Um, so this is this is white capping waves causing, or, you know, a combination of white capping waves and um, uh, probably suspended sediment from the increased river flow at the surface. But the, the thing here is that all four beams are seeing basically the same signal. So that gives you confidence that, you know, at least my sonar was operating properly. So again, um, correlation is the information content. And it, it's, it's a measurement of the signal to noise ratio of the, of the measurement of the, of the information signal to noise. Um, and 128 counts is perfect. And 64 counts, we would normally flag it as bad. Um, correlation, um, co your correlation can reduce if you have exceedingly large turbulence or, you know, turbulence, if you have, you have more mixing within the acoustic sample volume, you'll see a decrease in the correlation. And then as you get towards the end of the range of your ADCP, where you've got less signal strength, where your echo intensity is low, the, 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 um, the, the processing, the Doppler processing, the, is is going the correlation will will decrease as you run out of signal at the end of your range so if we look at if we look at the correlation uh, among all four beams right beam one beam two beam three and beam four we see um we see consistency right and during these periods where we have passing vessels right we're seeing a reduction in correlation and this vessel <laughs> this beam um, this is beam number four saw, you know, during this period here, beam one, two, and three saw the ship and beam four only partially saw it. So this is a beam that passed, or this is the ship passed within our sample volume where one beam didn't see it. But during this period of interest where the ocean skipped a beat, um, good correlation, you know, slightly reduced correlation at the surface, but all four beams are consistent. So error. Um, error is a measure of the flow homogeneity. So we report the east component of velocity, the north component of velocity, and um, the vertical velocity. So it's a 3D, three-component velocity um, profiling system. But the fourth... We have a over-resolved system. We only need three beams to give you three velocity components, but we throw in a, we use a fourth beam. So you have a measurement of homogeneity. We have an over-resolved system. We have four measurements and only three unknowns. So we basically simplistically difference beam one and two and three and four. We difference opposite beams. We sum them all up. Um, scale it so that it's proportional to the predicted standard deviation of the measurement, the predicted noise in the, in the, in the, you know, the single ping standard deviation of the estimated velocity measurement. And um, it's, it should be close to zero. It should be close to your predicted standard deviation. If it's not, then um, you had something wrong, most probably inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous, flow. And we do this, we do this screening on every single ping. So when we average this data set from the Verrazano was a was a six minute average data set. And this data set was from 2003, right? So um, back then we were averaging, we had to average because memory cards were memory was memory was scarce back then. Now with current, you know, modern memory cards, we can fill the we don't have to average, right? We we can we, um, we can store every single ping and we, we can sc screen every single ping in post-processing. But the ADCP does it, if you choose to average, the ADCP screens each, each individual ping is screened for high error velocity. And by the way, we also screen, we also transform each individual ping using the pitch and the roll of the measurement and the bin mapping uh, before we average to earth. And that's, um, that's important. Um, I know that there's, there's, uh, there's talk in the industry about other companies that are just now doing this. And, and we were kind of shocked at the time to learn that those companies hadn't been doing that back in the day. Um, who knew? Uh, but now they are. Um, it's interesting. You got to wonder, 
Why not? Why didn't they do it before? But um, screen sheets ping for unacceptable noise in the data, right? So if you have fish, right, where we, um, if you have a fish in one beam, you will have significantly inhomogeneous flow, exceedingly large turbulence or you know, eddy variability. Um, and um, it, it, air velocity also picks out really consistent obstructions from solid scatters like seawalls, <laughs> you know, or vessels. Um, and uh, so the resulting error velocity is after we've already screened out the obvious outliers in the raw data. And during this period where the ocean skipped the beat, you had uh, low errors. Um, there were elevated errors when the ships were passing. Um, in, you know, greater than five centimeters per second, which was five times, greater than five times our predicted estimate, you know, our predicted error, our predicted standard deviation. So, like I said, um, you know, for these particular bins, ADCP bins, range bins, and times, you would, my suggestion is that, um, you know, you report these, put error bars on your measurement, and, and if, and if, Anything doesn't make sense um, in the when you actually use the the information from the ADCP to do whatever transport or mixing calculations that you're doing. Um, you know, uh, I, I'd strongly recommend you use error in screening your data. But during this period, uh, when the wind was really blowing, we did see an increase in error, but still acceptable acceptable levels, right? So all in all, this data set, except for the periods when we've got passing ships. Uh, pretty good quality. So um, water direction, error, correlation, and, and echo. Basically, error, correlation, and echo, the three should be used in parallel. The most sensitive is error. Next is correlation. And then the third, the third, you know, of, of the, the of, of, tertiary importance is the echo intensity. Um, but the three are like the three amigos, you've got to use them all together. So in summary, errors should be less than five centimeters or five or less than five times your predicted standard deviation. Correlation should be between 120 and 64. And echo should be consistent among all the, all the beams. And if you see an anomaly in any of these in the time series, if you see deviations from the trend, and it should should be cause for further investigation. So all in all, I mean, this was this I kind of cherry picked this data set because it was so so interesting. But uh, um, this is a good data set, and um, you know, I really I, I would like to to follow up with each of you if if you have the time um, and kind of reduce help if you have any questions with your data set, um, please contact me, Paul Devine at Teledyne .com. I'm eight five eight two five four seven two zero four. You know, I really appreciate your time, and thank you very much. I, 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 um, no one interrupted me, so I don't know if that's a bad sign. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Paul. Thanks for that great presentation. Um, yeah, please, everyone, feel free to raise your hand. And oh, there's Andy. All right. Yeah. Hey, Paul. Thanks. That was actually a really nice overview. Um, so part of Unfortunately, some of the problems that we have is we're limited by old UUB platforms and their data rates. So we actually can't record all the correlations and the echo intensities that we want to um, because we really just have actually a throughput problem that will cause uh, kind of backseat issues. Your, the other your... problem we kind of run into a fairly regularly, uh, fairly often is we kind of have like possibilities of hardware, especially if like you are after a post, like really hard recovery. Um, and you know, we, you were privy to the conversations we were having with Wilbur and used FFT tests and things like that for internal noise. But do you guys have any sort of like flow diagram or just kind of guidelines in terms of what to look for for hardware issues specifically to the ABCPs? Yeah, so the, the PT test, the PT stands for pre deployment test. Uh, it should kind of be PDT, but anyway, the PT tests <laughs> are, um, 
you know, if you run those and any of them fail, then you've got cause for concern. The the phase the 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 150 kilohertz phased array that you guys have, you have to test it in, in a bucket, which is difficult when it's built into the into the AUV. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you get when you dunk the AUV, run all those pre deployment tests before you deploy. Definitely, um, and that's the hardware. That's the hardware checks. You know, that's prior to you actually getting any data. That's just running through all of your your hardware. So there's also those um, built-in tests that are each ensemble's got a built-in test flag. I didn't go there today, but you can you can export all those built-in test flags to see if any hardware issues occurred during the deployment. The bit tests, the bit field, the bit field in the in the data set. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, no, I think that's that's helpful. Just uh, appreciate it. Yeah. So anything else, guys? I mean, I'm, you know, please, please call um, or email and we can, we can set one of these, we could set, we could do one of these sessions with you or since you're right down the road, we can just, we could just, we can just show up, right? I, I need more excuses to come down to scripts, please, you know? Yeah, I can bring my surfboard and go surfing first. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for your time. Ron, you don't have any questions? Come on, Ron George. <laughs> Nothing? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Paul. We appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I don't see any questions or anybody raising their hand. So thanks again. We really appreciate your time today and the great presentation. I'm sure there will be follow on questions that come up. So again, yeah, thank you for sharing your information. Please, people, please feel free to reach out to Paul directly or I'm happy to coordinate uh, any types of meetings on campus. Um, and with that, I guess we can wrap up the technical forum.